So let's begin. Kentucky's biggest political issue on the ballot this year, Constitutional Amendment Number 2. We've discussed it many times here on RWB. This week, Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman, a well-known advocate for public schools, joined the debate with her strongest statement so far against the proposal. The highly debated ballot question will decide if your tax money can be spent on students outside of the public school system. Coleman argued that it threatens public school budgets and removes a layer of accountability. Supporters of the amendment say the current options aren't cutting it. They believe that state support for some students to attend charter or private schools would create competition to improve the whole system, arguing parents still keep officials responsible not with their vote, but by where they choose to enroll their kid for the best education. You may not have enough on that voucher to be able to afford it, right? Number one. Number two, assuming that you do, there is nothing that says that they have to admit your student. If your student has a special need that requires an IEP or a special education services, that, that school can say, oh, sorry, we don't provide that. There's no vouchers in this amendment. Um, there's no funding attached to this amendment. It is solely based upon the mindset of let's have those conversations that so many other states, including Indiana, uh, have already had and had those every day that we have we've gone as far as we can go. And that was Representative Suzanne Miles there who sponsored the original bill putting this amendment on the ballot. So at, at this point in the election, I'm curious how much people are understanding what's even on the ballot, what they're voting on, and, and if they're even aware of it. So I want to start with Senator Bledsoe here because I'm seeing a lot of press conferences being held by the vote no side. You were at the co press yes. conference this week. What about the vote yes side? Are people aware of, of, of really what's on the ballot? I don't think they are. I don't think they realize why we're even having the amendment in the first place. So what I've been telling voters is, you know, for the last decade, the General Assembly has been passing legislation to really empower student success, but then the Kentucky Supreme Court has ruled outside the common good uh, school system. And I'll give you an example. They passed legislation before I was there that would have put tax credits for low-income parents to do uh, computers, mentoring, and tutoring, and the Supreme Court ruled even that outside the common good system. Now, I think we can agree that computers and tutoring and mentoring for, for parents to have tools in their toolbox to provide student success is a good thing, and even that wasn't something that we were allowed to do. So this is really about un, un, taking the handcuffs off, actually, of the General Assembly and allowing us to have some tools and some ideas that would be a good idea is maybe be helpful for student success. And with that amendment passing, then we can have the conversations on what actually works to best empower students to be successful. Representative mm -hmm. Stevenson, your side calls this the voucher amendment, mm -hmm. as, as you mm -hmm. just heard Senator Bledsoe say there. This is at least being about being able to have the debate. Right. Do you see it the same way? Um, I don't. Obviously, I'm on the ballot myself in November, so I'm out knocking thousands of doors right now, and uh, we are hearing uh, a lot of people that are very concerned about the wording of the amendment. The amendment uh, says that we will not withstand seven whole sections of our Constitution to allow public funds to go into private institutions. And I think that the big problem there is there's nothing around that, as Suzanne Miles just said. Um, there's no language that actually tells us what that is. So essentially, the General Assembly is asking the people to write a completely blank check for them. Um, and I think that that's just dangerous. I think until we truly know what it is um, and what they want to do, then we shouldn't be voting to just say yes and let the General Assembly have free reign with that money when our Constitution is very, very, very specific about our system of common schools and not allowing institutions, private or um, religious, to have any of those funds. Okay. So, since you mentioned a finance point there, I want to bring up a conversation that I had with somebody actually this week who's not very politically involved, doesn't keep up with much going on, you know, in, in politics, but wants to know, hey, what's on the ballot, what's going on, and sort of trying to walk through what what the amendment would mean for them. Essentially, they reached the conclusion that, well, if, if they vote yes on this, and that means that potentially there could be more students that could, that could be covered um, by, by the state government, does that mean my taxes could go up? Now, we all know how it's a little bit more complicated than that. There, yes. There's you know budget reserves, uh, there's a rainy day fund, SEEK kind of works a little bit differently, but whenever people are, are kind of looking at things from that perspective, in that everyman perspective of how does this affect my bottom dollar, what do you say to them? I would say these are your public dollars to begin with. You know, we have put record investments into public education this year in the budget, and we'll continue to do so. 
But when you're talking about tax credits for low-income parents to support their kids, that's hardly taking money and putting it into a private education. We have the tightest institution, in, or, or if you will, a constitution interpretation by the state. That's why every other state around us and most of the country has options for flexibility. And we're elected to do education policy. And if we're not doing the right thing, I would think the voters would hold us account. This is about us having the flexibility even have the conversation of what makes sense. And I think we can agree that Kentucky could use some help and could have every tool in the toolbox to have better student success. Given there's about five weeks left until the election, there's only two ads up, one for either side yes. on this. Thinking back to two years ago, we had another amendment to up on a different issue, abortion, which I mean, we can all say is probably a lot more controversial than this issue. Yes. There was a lot more attention, it seemed, on that one. Are you all surprised by the amount of attention and, and political dollars that are going into this particular issue now? I am not. Um, again, we have a system right now um, Republicans want to say that they have given record investment, but when you go back to the 2008 when adjusted for inflation, we are still not even at those levels anymore. Um, we have seen other states do exactly what they're talking about doing. Arizona has a $1.4 billion shortfall in their budget because they are sending, spending so much money on vouchers, charters, and these types of educational accounts. And it is just not something that we can afford to do. We still don't full, fully fund uh, pupil transportation. We haven't paid for teacher PD in a long time. We haven't bought textbooks or updated a lot of technology that we should have. There are still a lot of gaps in public education. And I think that until we can fully fund that, we have no business talking about sending funds elsewhere. Quick last word. I think if funding was the issue, how much more money would it take? And nobody has that answer. We, over half of the state's budget goes to education, and we are still not meeting Kentucky's success options for kids. We're not meeting what they can do. I don't think funding is actually the issue. All right, we'll see what happens in November.